And folks, I'll tell you what, I am so excited to be here. And you'd say, well, Pastor, why are you so excited to be here? I'm, look, it, last night's about the first night I've slept all night long. In over four weeks, I've had this ugly cough. And uh, so I slept good, and I feel refreshed, and I feel good today. And, and uh, I don't know why I, I thought of this. I, I read this joke uh, this week. Now, this joke has nothing to do with my sermon. It's all in fun, ladies. Uh, this one hour says, not again. But uh, I read this this week, and y'all probably heard this before, but I just thought it was hilarious. Uh, this um, couple had went to, the, to Israel. They'd been wanting to go their entire life. And so they went over there, and, it's, uh, and he was always a grumpy old man and, and uh, just kind of hard to deal with. And, but along the trip, his wife passed away, and they came to him. And they said, uh, sir, what we've decided to do is lay your wife to rest at a place where when Jesus comes back, she'll be one of the first people to see Jesus. My, she'll be looking over the celestial gardens, and you know, I don't know how you do that when you're dead, but she'll be looking over the celestial gardens, and it's a place of joy and happiness. And we don't do this for just anyone, but it's only gonna be $150. Or we can fly your wife back home for 50,000. Which would you like? He said, I'll take the 50,000. And he said, why in the world do you not realize how blessed? He said, I'll take the 50,000. And uh, he pulled him off to the side and said, sir, why in the world would you take and spend 50,000 when you can bury and lay your wife to rest in a place of such blessing? He said, well, I heard tell that y'all did that a few thousand years ago when someone came back. And I just can't take that chance. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. I thought it was funny. Okay, let's get on to the sermon before y'all beat me up. Uh, <laughs> uh, becoming great, becoming great. I want to talk to you this morning about becoming great. Last week we talked about what our faith affords. And this morning I want to talk, what does it mean to become great in God's kingdom? If you're turning your Bibles to Luke 9, 46 through 48, this is a familiar text. It's one we've never looked at before, but once since I've been here. But uh, what's happening is, is Jesus and the disciples, they're kind of traveling along. And it's not just the disciples, there's other people around. And there began this argument, this dispute among the disciples. And it wasn't, this wasn't one of those little hush-hush arguments that you have when everyone's around. I mean, people began to notice it was so much so that even Jesus noticed that they were having this argument. And the argument was over who is the greatest and what position they would hold in Christ's kingdom. You see, the disciples hadn't quite understood what Christ's kingdom was. You know, even this day, sometimes we do the same thing. We think about becoming great in Christ's kingdom. We make it more of a professional thing. Well, if you're going to be great in God's kingdom, you've got to be a pastor or a teacher, or you've got to work on church staff or be a missionary. But yet in our text today, not once does Christ ever mention title or position. But Christ does set the record straight. He does get their attention. So with that being said, let's talk about this morning. What does it, what does it mean to become great in God's kingdom. Let's read our text. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, he knew what they were thinking is what he's saying. All right, that little mini sermon here. God knows what we're thinking, folks. Now, we may want to look all righteous and like we're doing good things sometimes, but God knows our heart. God knew their hearts. He took a child and put, them, and put him by his side and said to them, who, who, <clears throat> Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your text. Thank you, Lord, for letting us learn what it means to become great as we unpackage this this morning. I pray our hearts will be open and receptive. Lord, no doubt this is a familiar text to many in this room, probably fresh to some that have never heard it. But God, I pray that this would be a challenge to each of us. Lord, that we would leave this day understanding what it means to be great in your sight, not in others. So, Lord, I pray for the lost today. 
those that do not know you, those that do not claim you as Father, I pray for those of us that do know you. But Lord, somewhere along the way, have grown lax and comfortable. God, never let us get to a place that we forget our calling and our purpose. So bless this time. Let us be attentive to what you have for each heart and each soul. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. Well, I'll tell you what. One thing I love about this text is Jesus sure knew how to shut them up. You know, that's how God does. Sometimes, you know, sometimes he just says, look, I, I wish you'd just be quiet and listen. Here they are doing all this ruckus. And, 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 and I would imagine that Jesus was slightly embarrassed with what was taking place. Here my disciples are. They're supposed to be the cream of the crop. And I hear arguing who's going to have what position and who's going to be the greatest. Goodness, gracious alive. I imagine Jesus talked a little bit southern. <laughs> so he, he begins to talk to him. But now I do want to pause and digress and say this. I'm grateful for what's taking place with these disciples. I'm grateful the Bible shows the humanity of even the disciples. They weren't perfect. They weren't perfect men. Sometimes we look at these men and we look at people in the Bible and we think, man, if I could, be, oh, if I could just be perfect like them. So I love the fact that in this text we see that the disciples are human just like us. They make mistakes just like us. It helps me with my failures. It helps me to know that even though they failed at times, God still loved them and desired to use them. And that's a great encouragement for me. You may walk on the road of perfection in your life, but I seem to stumble over so many rocks in mine. So I am grateful that the text shows their humanity. But I also am grateful what's taking place here. Now, what does it take to become great? Well, God gives us two ways. First of all, there's action. He shows us that there's action. Notice before Jesus said a word, he took action. The action that Jesus took could be done by anybody in this room. Now, here's some things that didn't. Here's some things. I said, what, what did Jesus not do to become great? Well, I put it this way. He didn't preach a sermon. He didn't start a new mission. He didn't start a new project. He didn't fight a holy war. He didn't fight a holy war or start a foundation or plant a church. He didn't go to missions way off or start a new ministry. Now, none of that's wrong in itself, but when Christ begins to do something, he takes action. And what I notice is all the things that we think it takes to become great, Christ did none of that to show them what greatness is in his sight. I think sometimes we feel we can't do things because we're like, well, I, I can't, I can't do as good as them or I could never get up and preach or I could never get up and teach and I, Lord knows I, I really can't get up and travel across the world anymore. I, these are things I, I can't plan a church or, or do anything like that. I'm, I'm just never going to be considered anything of great value in God's kingdom but that's, that's not what Christ is depicting here. So how does Christ take action? First he reaches out. Our text says he took a child. While everyone was watching him Jesus simply reached out and took a child, an innocent, humble spirit. Not a king, not a politician, a banker, or a wealthy person, a scribe or priest, or someone of great influence. He reached out and took a child. Just like in that day as today, children are not considered of anything of great stature. Most of the time, I, I'm, we're like, we're just... just Try to keep them quiet, and keep them out of the way. We're, our hope is one day they will become great. But while they're little, we're like, just keep them quiet. But what did God do? What did Jesus do? God do? He, he, Christ reached out and simply took what was considered the lowest of stature among him. He reached out. But not only did he do that, he drew him near the actions of drawing near. It says he put him by his side. Not only did Jesus reach out for a child, but he drew him closely to his side. This let everyone know that he wanted the child close to him. It was a place of relationship. It was a place of companionship, of intimacy and comfort. It shows love for the child. By Christ drawing this child near to him, it says, I want this child close to me. 
the two actions that Christ took to become great were simply this, reaching out and drawing people close to him, drawing a child close to him. Greatness to Jesus is not what man sees, and I put it this way, in social stature, wealth, or precisions of authority and of influence. You know, none of that impresses God. It doesn't matter if you're the president of a country or a king. It doesn't matter if you're the wealthiest or smartest. None of that impresses God. God's got all that and then some. What matters is what are you doing? What are you really doing? You see, the actions of becoming great to God, to Jesus, are those that reach out to a whole world and draw them near to him. What are you doing with that? Are you becoming great by taking action? Notice, Jesus didn't do anything that not one of us can't do in this room today. Every single person in this room has the ability to reach out and draw people near to Christ. You see, we, we, many times we'll walk out of sermons and we'll walk out of worship and we'll think, well, you know, one day when I have the time, one day when everything is, is honky-dory in my life and I'm able to actually get outside my comfort zone. Folks, let me tell you, God never asked you to be in a comfort zone. But through his actions, he showed us that he wants us to reach out and draw people near to him. But what was the second thing he did? He had articulation. I wanted to find something that matched action. So I said articulation. Big word for he spoke. He talked about why he did what he did. Let's read our text. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is greatest. Jesus goes on to explain his actions. So what did he do? He explains what the child represents. The child represents the whole world. Every single human being, every single person. Now this is going to upset some people, but and I don't mean for it to, but God loves people outside the United States of America. This isn't the only country that God loves. I believe that we live in one of the greatest nations to ever be on the face of the earth. But I also know that God loves every single nation. And when Christ wrote, said, spoke of this child, he's saying, look, I love everyone. I, I don't have a favorite. I don't have a favorite nationality. I don't have a favorite ethnicity. I don't have a favorite country. I don't have a favorite anything. My whole creation in humanity is my favorite. I love everyone. Even the people that you may this morning despise. Even the person at work that you can't stand. Even the, even the in-laws that you may have to tolerate. God loves them too. I know that's hard to believe. The people that put all their junk on Facebook <laughs> and then have the audacity. I don't know why everybody's in my business. <laughs> it's because your business is all over the world. God bless them. <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> God loves them too. God loves the people that will chop off the heads of Christians today. That's hard to think, isn't it? That we have brothers and sisters in other countries that will lose their life. They will be martyred today. And we think we need to strike out, and you know what? There does need to be punishment. But somewhere along the lines, those men that do those things were taught as children how to hate. I do believe there's a lot of things in life that we're trying to make up. Say, well, you know, that's just the way it is. You're born with that. I, there's a lot of things we try to ascribe to that. But I'll tell you one thing you're not born with and you learn, and that is hate. I was raised in the deep south. I was raised where the white man is considered the man. And then I met Jesus. And I come to understand that all men, all women, all children, all people are loved equally by God. And at the foot of the cross, it's all level. 
hate is raised. My friends, our, we will never be a people that love the world and love all that God has for us if we're going to be a people that judge others. Well, pastor, is it their sin? Yes, their sin. Do we accept sin? No, we can't accept sin. But it's not our rule. It's not our job to judge. It's simply just to share the love of the world. Let God fix people's hearts, not us. You see, my friends, becoming great means understanding that wherever you are, God can use you, even at work. Even at work. Not only that, not only did he explain what the child represents, he explains what we receive. Jesus goes on to tell what we receive when we become great in his kingdom. Remembering his kingdom is a kingdom that is not of earth. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's God's kingdom. It's the heavenly kingdom. So what do we have? What do we receive? We receive a relationship. It means to become great with God is to receive God himself. This is done only through his son, Jesus Christ. A familiar text, John 14, 6, and Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through me. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. He goes on to explain, if you want to be great in my kingdom, You must receive me because I am the gift. I am the blessing that God has sent to you so that you can have relationship with your Father. That word receive is an interesting word, a little bit more explained. simply means to accept or to take hold of. You see, this whole world's a hurtful place. We started the beginning of the year, and I said for 2018, it's going to be a great year for some. It's going to be a horrible year for others. In our own church family, we've already had two or three families devastated with news. Terrible news. Life-shattering news. In some cases, relationships have come to an end. and others, life is coming to an end. They thought the future was going to be bright and glorious. They come to find out it's going to be filled with great distraction or not much life at all. You see, walking with God doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It does mean that God walks with us in the hardest of times. You say, Pastor, why would you share that? Because I believe in every place of worship around the world today there are going to be people that are hurting possibly in this room right now you've never accepted Christ you don't know what it means it simply means this you received you take hold of the one gift that changes lives that gives hope you see Christ went on to explain if you reach out and draw people near to me and if they receive me They'll receive a hope and a life. They'll receive mercy and grace they've never understood. Starting this year, we now have active contacts with Governor Bent, Cleveland, and through what Ira's doing with the, or- with, with the band at Denmore High School. We don't do that just to do it. We do that because we're trying to reach out and let people know that God loves them. We're trying to draw them near to the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, when we get around them, how do we do that? We show our hearts. We smile. How would you like it if your pastor got up every single Sunday and I got up instead of being happy and, and, and I hardly ever tell jokes. But, uh, you know, I got to Well, it was another miserable week. Let's get this over with so I can get my paycheck, go home, and just be more miserable. Y'all look miserable too. How would y'all like that? Now, some of you kind of do some Sundays. You come in every Sunday. You're like, Pastor, I look like that. I'm not going to point you out. Golly, mom, you're like, well, Lord. And I'm like, man, how you doing? Good. I'm doing good. Why? 
Why do I not look like I'm doing good? You don't say that. That's why. Smile. Let the world know you got Jesus and you got something special in your life. Let the world know that you've taken hold of and accepted and received the one thing that gets you through even the most miserable of times. Talked to my mom last night. She sounds rough. She just got back from the hospital. She got the flu. I guess someone that had the flu got around her. I felt slightly guilty. My brother Mike's got the flu. I think my brother Bart's got the flu. I learned that no matter if you're feeling better or not, if you've had the flu, don't go around your family. I think I might have got them sick. But my mom's like, oh, it's okay, honey. I said, well, Mom, you, you're 71 years old, and you've got a lot of problems. I ain't trying to be mean. But you don't need to be going out and about. You need to stay home. This, this flu's killing people. Oh, well, honey... God calls me home. I'm ready to go. I'm right with the Lord. Well, being a mama's boy, I'm not quite ready for that. I kind of like having her around, you know. That's my mommy. I mean, mom, I'm a grown man. That's my mother. I went home for Christmas, and I just sat next to her. She's done what she's done. She just pats me on the back of the head. I don't know why. Her arms can barely reach. She's only five foot tall. But I'm only five foot eight, so I guess it ain't that hard of a stretch. <laughs> but you know what a blessing it is to know that your mama tells you, even though you want to be selfish and have it for a lifetime, it's okay. I'm okay with God. You see, the reception, the, when we receive Christ, we have this peace that no matter what we go through in life, we're going to be okay. Becoming great in God's kingdom. As far as being followers of Christ, we need to reach out and bring people close to the Lord so they can receive the same gift we have. You say, well, pastor, what stops that? What hinders us from doing that? Well, we do. Sometimes we kind of get in the way. Jesus isn't concerned with who is great on earth. He's concerned with who wants to be great in this kingdom, who wants to share him. It says in our text, For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. His word least, referring to those that the world will call small, insignificant, least, or little. Truth is, the world don't think much of our testimony in Jesus. We know that to be true. Matter of fact, for some people, if you tell them you're a believer, they drop your IQ points and they drop your stature. They think you're small-minded because you've got to have a fictitious God. That's the world we live in. But we've got to get past what the world thinks and understand what Christ has called us to do. And sometimes we can kind of get in the way. I, I put this up. Greatness in Jesus' kingdom does not come from earthly titles. It comes from telling of Jesus on the earth. Greatness in God's kingdom, listen, does not come from earthly titles. It comes from telling of Jesus on the earth. That's what greatness is in God's kingdom. The thing is, is we, here's, here's the hardest thing we have to deal with. It's not about us. We're the biggest obstacle in the church today. We are. We think that we matter so much that we go doing all the things except the two things that God asked us to do. Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. How do you become great? Two simple steps. You accept the gift of the cross, and then you share that gift to every single person that you come into contact with. It's that simple. In a world that is so complex, 
that is so hard to grasp and understand. Isn't it great that Jesus looked at his disciples and those around him and us today and said, do you want to know what greatness really is? Do you really want to know? Just love me and share that love with others. So if that's the only thing that Christ has asked, I ask you today, are you becoming great in God's kingdom? If the measurement of becoming great is simply accepting that love and then sharing it with others, are you becoming great in his kingdom? Oh, well, preacher, I, I sing in the choir. We need more people singing in the choir, by the way. Well, preacher, I do this and I do that. That's great. I, I think every single person that's doing something in this church, I appreciate that and it's needed. But that is not greatness in God's kingdom. Greatness is telling a lost and dying world, God still loves you. Or simply the next question, have you accepted that gift? Have you received Jesus and his gift of love? You see, you can't share the gift if you don't have it. You won't even get excited about it if you don't have it. He'll love you just like you are. Pastor, I've done horrible things. It's all right, he still loves you. You can still become great. You can become great at sharing love, God's love, if you accept it. Let's go, Lord, in prayer.